Well, a very good afternoon to you. Welcome to Xandermonium, the talk show that gets you talking. I'm Xander Gibb, and on today's show, I'll be breaking down this week's harder topics with my guest co-host, broadcaster, libertarian, and free thinker, Tony Lusaco. You can interact with us during the show in the chat room at the bottom of the page, or you can call us with your comments or questions on 347-884-9061. That's 347 884 You can also tweet us. My Twitter handle is at Xander Gibb, X-A-N-D-E-R-G-I-B-B. And Tony's Twitter handle is at FullStory2014. That's F U W L S T O R Y. 2014. Tweet me if you're too shy, and I will make sure we make your point for you. It really is good to be back. We've uh, not been with you for a couple of weeks. The first week I was sick, and the week after that, uh, Ty was sick too. There's a lot of it about, but it is indeed great to be back with you. Oh, yes, indeed. So the decision was handed down this week in the case of Officer Darren Wilson, who shot and killed an unarmed individual, Michael Brown. Now, once again, the country was divided on this issue, and some could only see that the a police officer shot and killed an unarmed black youth. And every other detail went out of the window aside of these issues. Now, I always feel bad when someone is killed regardless of their ethnicity. And in this situation, we also need to consider the feelings of the officer involved. Now, we've been given the impression far too often that Officer Darren Wilson was just a gung-ho racist who killed Michael Brown without thought. But I don't think anything could be further from the truth. Now, I'm convinced that it's something that Officer Wilson will never forget as long as he lives. Now, the first thing that comes to my mind is that if an armed police officer gives you an instruction and you have nothing to hide, surely you would just do as you had been asked and remain calm and polite. Now, eyewitness testimony clarified there was an altercation and that Michael Brown slammed the car door on Officer Wilson and punched him in the face, which is clearly not the beginning of any kind of civil discourse. It's also clear that Mr. Brown had been involved in a crime immediately prior, as he still had the merchandise on him at the time. It's also clear that Mr. Brown attempted to take Officer Wilson's gun from him, as he had a gunshot residue um, on his hands. Now, I would think that most people would be aware that if you try and wrestle a gun from a police officer, one of the possible side effects is that you might get shot, unfortunately, which happened. I know I do not envy the job of the police having to make split-second sec- split decisions as a part of their job. Now, the problem is making split-second decisions, uh, sometimes one is not always going to get that right. Now, Mr. Brown eluded capture and ran away pursued by Officer Wilson. Now, the police are allowed to to use deadly force if they feel their safety is threatened, and clearly this officer did. Now, the danger of any of these issues is to generalize, and I believe most police officers are not racist and don't go to work with a mind to kill. And if we are ever to evolve as a society, we have to stop with the generalizations. Now, I would, whilst I would be prepared to admit that there are bad cops out there, as you would find in any profession, but we cannot label every officer as such. And they are the first ones that we call in an emergency. Now, I pray for peace in Ferguson, and I also pray for the families of both Michael Brown and Officer Darren Wilson, and for healing for the community. Now, before we can ever come together, we need to look at what we have in common rather than what our differences are, as that will be always be a barrier to any unity. Now, it was, uh, it was announced yesterday that Officer Wilson resigned, and I wonder how many more cops have to resign or how many potentially good cops won't even sign up due to the concerns regarding color before come upholding the law. Uh, we'll be speaking about this later on in the show, so if you have an opinion, call us on 347 884 and tell us what you think. 
That was Xander's Soapbox for this week. If you'd like to come and get on your soapbox, email me at xander at xandergib.com. That's xander at xandergib.com. Oh, yes, indeedy. Hello to everybody in chat. And my guest co-host today, joining me to break down the hotter topics, the issues that matter is... Tony Lasacco, broadcaster, libertarian, and free thinker. Welcome back to the show, Tony. How you doing? Good. How you doing, Xander? I'm good, but it's cold today. Is it cold where you are? Yes, it is. Very cold, actually, in Florida for me. <laughs> Too cold. Yeah. I I always thought that um that some areas of the south coast of Florida got really uh got got good weather when it was cold or or do you get always get like the same um no. the same as uh, as the rest of the east coast no and some of your viewers might, some of your listeners might hate me when i say cold i mean i have to put a sweatshirt on cold <laughs> it's probably like right. 60 degrees out right now <laughs> oh that's not cold it's like it's like 53 here we've had it in the 30s in the past couple of weeks so i i don't think with that, that uh that's that cold, but I suppose it depends on uh, your definition uh, of cold. Now, one of the things that uh, jumped out to me uh, over the past week or so, uh, I don't know if you read about this story, Tony, was that um, the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan, now welcomes Jews, blacks, and gays. So for anyone living under the rock, the KKK is a white supremacist group notorious for homophobic and racist violence, including the lynching of black people. Now, the Ku Klux Klan is now looking to diversify. Well, that that made me laugh, too, to, to say the least, and increase its membership to include Jews, black people, and homosexuals, and those of Hispanic origin with a rebranding as the new Klan. Now, all those wanting to join the extreme right-wing group will still have to wear the white robes, masks, and a conical hat to take part in the ritu rituals, according to the founder, John Abar. Bradley Jenkins, Imperial Wizard. Now, I've heard of a pinball wizard, but never an Imperial Wizard. Of uh, mm -hmm. the KKK, it said, the man's going against everything um, and the bylaws of the constitution of the KKK. He's trying to hide behind the KKK to further his political career. Now, the Klan is classified as a hate group by the Anti-Semitism Organization, Anti-Defamation League, and the civil rights law firm, Southern Poverty, Poverty Law Center. But some black people have apparently already, already oddly expressed an interest in joining after Mr. Abar organized the summit with civil rights groups. And the requirements for joining the KKK are you need to be over 18, live in the Pacific Northwest, now, the first Klan was founded in 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee, by six veterans of the Confederate Army. Recent estimates suggest that there are between 5,000 and 8,000 members. So are you going to be running out and joining Tony, or is this just too ridiculous for words? Well, I don't think it's ridiculous at all. In fact, I thought the first I heard the story was... Hello? Yes, I don't think it's ridiculous uh, we, at all, Xander. Oh. Go on. We lost you for a moment. Go on. Can Can you hear me? Xander? I can hear you now. Yeah, you just okay. you just faded away well, a little. I don't think it's ridiculous at all. Although I confess, the first news of it I heard was when you uh, sent me the link and I read about it. But I mean, to me, it's no surprise. I mean, come on, a a bunch of old white guys with hoods on. I mean, come on, they were closet homosexuals the whole time. They're just coming out of the closet. <laughs> so that isn't they're welcoming it, gay it kind people of, now would, 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 just seem a, would, would just seem a naturally progressive journey for a bunch of, you know, uh, crazy pedophiles, wow. you know? <laughs> of course, and I'm maybe it's, Maybe it's so they can claim more of a tax-exempt status or something like that, but because, because they're now kind of like opening up the inclusion. But it's not, it's not a group that I would want to be a member of, really. <laughs> I don't really see too many minorities or gay people or anything rushing to the ranks of the KKK. Though, though I must say, I mean, depending on the leadership, organizations do 
I mean, this would probably be one of the most dramatic shifts in history, but organizations change with time, whether it's a nonprofit or a political group, uh, political parties, right. more from other parties. So, you know, perhaps, you know, a hundred years from now, the KKK could be known as the great conservative values organization and oh. say, well, back oh. in our history, we started off wrong, but now we're something different. You never know. <laughs> Do you think that people are going to be able to forget that quickly? Because I know that, you know, uh, per, you know, personally uh, with my Jewish heritage, et cetera, et cetera, I I could not be I could not be involved with with, with that group. Uh, but but apparently some black people have already joined. I mean, do you think that's out of curiosity, or do you think that that's out of a, a genuine kind of like interest? Well, I think you have to understand the history of the KKK a little bit. I mean, yes, it was racist, and I am not defending the KKK. However, they always showed themselves as basically like um, the Tea Party of conservatives. I hate to make the analogy, but we're defending morality and values. You know, like the Confederate South, how it was started was, you know, we're high society, we're morals, and the North is ruining our morality, you know. So we're going to be the secret right. organization defending traditional values. So, you know, now the KKK is like possibly saying, well, see, we're just a conservative organization defending traditional values. Times have changed and we're including these people. I think that what's going to happen is that there's going to be a civil war within them. <laughs> that guy will be killed or assassinated or who knows what, or splinter groups will split off because, I mean, everybody knows what the KKK stood for was racism and oppression. I mean, exactly. and I don't see too many minorities or of any sort joining it. However, that's why I kind of said 100 years or so, you never know what organizations, how how they morph and change over the years. I mean, we, we could look at Yasser Arafat, who was a terrorist, who killed people. Right. Um, and hey, he was known in the end as the great peacemaker, right? I mean, that's what they celebrate. Nelson Mandela started off with car bombs and bombings. He morphed from a terrorist into the world's great leader, Nelson Mandela. That's all that record. So why should the KKK be any different, actually? I mean, we've done it with Nelson Mandela. We, we've done it with Yasser Arafat. We turned terrorists into heroes eventually. I mean, I don't see the, you know, maybe the KKK is looking at the history of the PLO and, and you know, Nelson Mandela's organization and saying, hey, we can do that, too. <laughs> but but is it too soon, Tony? I mean, you know, this is, all of these things are within our recent history. I mean, I know people that are in their um, 60s and yeah. 70s that, that have told me about the fact that they, uh, you know, had to uh, ride at the back of the bus and drink from different water fountains and, and, and things like that. So what? that's within the... That's within the recent memory of some people that are still alive. What? So do you think that changing its um, ideology is, that is going to be that easy uh, and changing its public face is going to be that easy for them? Well, and that's where, you know, as far as recent history goes, first of all, I mean, I think it's a joke, number one. I don't think they're really intending to change, or if so, this guy is just one person in the organization who will be booted out or shot. That's what I think. I don't think the KKK right. has suddenly changed everything it stands for, number one. But as far as recent yeah. history goes, yes, people have short memories. I mean, I still I still remember on the news from when I was little, you know, the, 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 the car bombs and things and the explosions at hotels that killed innocent people and dismembered bodies all over the right. place from innocent people that, like I said, Yasser Arafat was responsible for the death of and Nelson Mandela was responsible for. And, you know, you wouldn't hear that on the news. So I think that people, depending on the times, yeah, they do have short memories. And I don't think it's fair to discount the KKK and give the PLL or Nelson Mandela's organization, the African National Congress, a pass. Because those groups killed and massacred people as well. But their leaders in the end were known as great leaders. we got to have the same, the same standard. <laughs> I, I totally, I totally uh, see what you're saying, but... But do you think do you think America do you think America as a whole can be that forgiving about those issues? No, because I think we have a certain narrative in this country from the powers that be, and I think that 
they will not allow the KKK to obtain that status. I think that people manipulate the news and the media. Like I said, with Nelson Mandela's funeral, I heard very little about the bombings or the terrorism or the innocent lives he took. All you heard was a great world leader in world mourning. I don't think that the powers would be, powers that be would allow that of the KKK. You know, then again... I I mean... I do kind of I do remember at the time of Nelson Mandela's funeral that people were there were certain people that were calling him a terrorist. Um, so so they certainly couldn't forget his um, you know his ideology. I I mean now I don't mean to just Tony are you on speakerphone? No, I'm not. Uh, believe it or not, it's a handset. I'm usually on my Bluetooth. Getting some uh, getting some feedback. It's probably damned blog talk, uh, but we'll mm-hmm. but we'll persevere. I, I keep hearing my myself back in my ear, um, but uh, God bless blog talk. Um, so do you think long term that people are going to be actually joining uh, joining up, or, or do you think that? I don't think I don't think so. I mean. Then again, once again, you don't want to discount historical patterns and trends. For one thing, we don't know, as sad and scary as it is to say, how many people are really members of that organization in secret. You know? Right. right. We, 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 don't, we don't know <laughs> who the KKK is necessarily. We see the idiots on TV, the ones with the shaved heads and the real racist whatever. But, you know, who knows if this is a progression – and they're coming out of the woodwork now little by little, and their new focus could be immigrants, you know? They could be remaking right. themselves, right. for instance, saying, hey, we're against these illegal immigrants, and that could be the target of their hate, and welcome the blacks and the homosexuals, you know? They've always been about I, I hate, just, so maybe, maybe it's I just that. think it's going to be a hard thing to, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to be involved with them or subscribe to them or listen to anything that they had to say. And not just because they'd been against me and mine, but they've been about hate from the beginning. And and see, nor would I, and I don't think nor would any reasonable person join an organization with that in its history. Um, Right. But there is a lot of historical precedent for it. I mean, you never know. Look at what's going on in the Middle East right now. Al-Qaeda is being considered a moderate group compared to ISIS. 20 years from now, we might be fighting alongside Al-Qaeda. And what if they legitimized and became a political group? You know, we right. wouldn't think that right. today, but nobody would remember the history probably. Very few people. I mean, people have forgotten 9-11 as it is, basically. So imagine 20 to 30 years from now, we're fighting beside, say, Al-Qaeda, who's denounced terrorism because bin Laden's been dead for so many years, and they're resurfacing, and they're the voice of the Islamic world. I mean, it's conceivable based on history and the way these groups change. That's all I'm saying. Would I want to be a part of it? Absolutely not. Do I condone it? No. Right. To me, right. to me a, 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 what's that? A leopard don't change its spots, so to speak, you know? <laughs> so I, I, I don't kind think of, they I would find them hard changed. to I would find them hard to trust. I mean, you're absolutely right. We do get have this attitude that a leopard never changes its spots. And I'm kind of surprised that, um, I, I mean, I laughed out loud because I thought it was um, a joke, you know? It does seem like sorry, a joke. And I, I, didn't, I didn't read too much other than the links you sent me, honestly, of it, and I do want to look into it more. But I suspect that this is one man within the organization, maybe – that may be the one leader right now, and I suspect that the KKK is not going to have this massive transformation, that that guy's either going to be mysteriously killed or booted out of power. I doubt that <laughs> that the head of the organization can suddenly go against everything, like it said in your link, the whole charter and the whole basis of the organization. I mean, that's a exactly. little too much. <laughs> I mean, I I think so too, but I I think that most people will respond to it um, in the way that I have. I, I you know, would I think that agree. people are not going to be able to take it seriously, and and I think that um, you know, whilst every group has the potential uh, to evolve and change, true, I I don't see. I don't see that this is, is possible for them, really. I think there's, I think there's too much of a, um, 
Oh, gosh. Oh, this gosh. is ridiculous now. Ridiculous now. Uh, Blog Talk uh, are looking Blood into the, uh, uh, the echo. It's the terrible. Echo. It's terrible. Are you hearing are it, you too? Hearing it I know I'm not. And that's really odd that I'm not. Weird. Because the, um, the, uh, the people listening are telling me they're, they're hearing the the weird echo. I'm I'm just talking to Blog Talk to uh about it. Um so so you're you're not gonna be joining then is the short answer to that. N- no no more than I would be reaching out to the PLO or the African National Congress. Like I like I said, I mean I as you know I put truth in perspective and you know let's not jump one organization when we've forgiven these other organizations that have killed innocent people and massacred them as well and the leaders. Right. You know? Absolutely. And I think and I think that the people will make up their own minds. People will, will, will decide for themselves um about what uh about what organizations they're gonna follow and uh support. But 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 I really don't see myself kind of being involved with this one iota, really. No. Um, so as you as you probably heard at the foot of the show, my my preamble today uh, was to do with uh, the things that have been happening in Ferguson and the fact that they just um, decided not to indict um, uh, Officer Darren Wilson in the uh, in the killing of um, my brain is gone. Michael, what's his last Brown. name? Uh, Brown. Michael Brown. I think. Um, and there's been a lot of there's been a lot of uh, different uh, responses responses to that. And according to protesters who uh, erupted in violence early um, after the grand jury declined not to indict uh, Officer Darren Wilson in the shooting death of Michael Brown. Um, Apparently, the case they're saying that the case was of a white policeman shooting an unarmed black teenager with with his hands in the air in a community plagued by racial tension. Now, there's been so many different versions um, of events with this, but but first of all, tell us tell us what you feel about the fact that he wasn't indicted, um, and whether you feel he should have been indicted, and. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about um, the whole incident itself. Okay. Well, let me begin by saying that there is there's one thing that I do hold in common with the protesters and those disagreeing with the verdict. I do believe that that prosecutor should have recused himself because I heard, I read, I did a lot of reading on the topic, and apparently Officer Wilson was allowed to testify at the grand jury proceeding in his own defense. That's not normal in a grand jury proceeding. A grand jury right. proceeding is right. there just to hear the evidence against the person. So I think that there was a misrepresentation or a miscarriage of justice on that and that the prosecutor might have indeed been biased because it is not a common thing. Grand juries, I believe, have a 99% indict rate. Okay, you do not... The whole grand jury process is about hearing the prosecutor's evidence, not the defense case. That comes at trial. So I right. do, I do, in all fairness, believe that the prosecutor should have recused himself, and that it may might not have been a a fair proceeding. However, that being said, he wouldn't have been convicted in a court of law. There is complete and total reasonable doubt. Absolutely, 100%. And as far as this no justice, no peace rant, um, I think that it's absolutely insane. Let me, let, let, let's go with what the protesters would want. So this man was put before a grand jury to investigate his crime. The grand jury right. found lack right. of evidence. So it's not like – it's not a case, and we need to distinguish – if there were no charges brought against this officer and no investigation conducted, I'd be sympathetic with the protesters and I'd be out there chanting with them. Okay? Right. But the legal system fulfilled its responsibility. They had the right to protest, to have them indicted, and everything like that. But the legal system did what it would do for any white person, for any black person. It acted impartially in that manner. 
He was brought up on charges before a grand jury. A jury of his peers stated there was not enough evidence to bring it to trial. Is the legal process. Now, what the protesters want, here's what I think. If we are to give in to the protesters, because they're saying that justice wasn't carried out. No, justice was carried out. They don't like the outcome of the criminal justice system. So that would amount to mob rule. So if we're going to have mob rule in this country, then I tell you what, let's take every African-American in this country and give the protesters what they want. We'll just let the white communities in every neighborhood decide whether the African-Americans who are alleged to have committed a crime or look suspicious should be in jail or arrested. Why don't we just do that? We'll we'll take a vote of the white population or the neighborhoods and every African-American, even if even if the police find no evidence of wrongdoing, we'll just arrest them based on public opinion. I say we do that in this country because that's what the protesters want. That's what the protesters want. They want to disregard the justice system and go with mob rule. So, you know what, if if we're going to do that, fine. But let's have fairness on it. We'll disregard the justice system, and every time a black person in this country is accused of a crime, we won't let the justice system deal with it. We'll have the mob, the, the, white, the white people at the time or the neighborhood residents decide and take a vote. Oh, what do we think? Is this person guilty? And we'll do it then. Right. right. Bet they wouldn't like that. <laughs> you see, what really – the thing that concerns me the most about this – yeah, I'm very sad I'm that very the young sad man the young was man. killed – but as I said at the as foot said of, the the show, of the show, um, um, w- when does color, when does when sh- color when should not kind of interfere kind of with the law? Because if you've law. committed a crime, then then regardless of the color of your skin, the police are in in that position to to deal with with, with people who have committed crimes. And if and you if you, you start it off start by, it off by Punching the, the Punching police officer in the face and and slamming his car door upon him, and then by trying to take his gun and you actually are shot in the process, who is to blame for that? Well, that depends on if the officer's story is to be believed, of course. Okay, because I wasn't there. Right. I don't know what happened. Unlike 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 Michael Brown's mother. I'm not judging a man and being a hypocrite and saying, this man's a murderer, but don't judge my son when he was on TV committing a strong arm robbery. I'm not going to be hypocritical like that. I right. don't know. I wasn't there to know whether this man is a racist or shot an unarmed kid and deserves to be in jail or anything. I wasn't there. What I do know is if the story is to be believed, then that was a justified use of force. No different than if somebody came at us and was charging. I know if I was in a fight with somebody and they were charging at me and I couldn't defend myself and there was a stick or a knife or something near me, in the heat of the moment, I'd use it because it would be my life or his. I mean, that's justifiable force on a citizen's part. And it's also justifiable if the officer's story is to be believed and Michael Brown was charging at him and struggling for the gun. There is no doubt legally or moral or ethics-wise that that officer had a justified use of force. Now, that's a big if. Right. However, the the, thing that's being neglected – go ahead, Xander. No, I was just going to say, but did, but the, but they did do a gun shot residue test, residue test and and uh, on, uh, on uh, Michael, Brown, Michael Brown, and it was and it was revealed it was that revealed that he had gun shot residue gun on his hand, and if he'd, hand, not, and if he'd not had his hands near a gun, gun, that wouldn't have been, that the wouldn't been the case. And that's true, but once again, I'm not in the courtroom. I didn't hear the testimony, and I don't have the evidence in front. So so I'm just giving the benefit of the doubt, saying I. I wasn't there. The story, from what I heard, is consistent with the justified use of force. I wasn't there. What I'm very upset about, and at first it was the rioting, okay? That really, really, like, had me on the tangent, as you know, okay? But what I'm more upset about now is this man being portrayed like Trevon Martin, Michael Brown, okay? Let's take case A and case B. Trevon Martin was an unarmed black teenager that was shot for no reason, okay? Now, we can debate whether he smoked pot or he was a thug or not or whatever, but that was a clear case of no reason, no cause. Unarmed black kid, shot. 
However, Michael Brown, and it sickens and disgusts me that he's being portrayed as some innocent kid in the media. Right. At, right. at best, we have video of him assaulting a storekeeper. That would be a bully. Right. At absolute best, taking just the known facts, he was a thug and a bully who assaulted somebody who committed battery on a storekeeper. Now, whether it was a strong-arm robbery or not, that's what the evidence points to. Now, they're debating whether it was or wasn't, but at best, he was a thug and a bully. He intimidated using his force and his size and assaulted somebody else. That is not an innocent, poor kid. So let's cut the ball. I mean, it, it's absolute total. It turns my stomach. At least be honest about it and say, okay, well, he was a bully. Yeah, he, he, he might have had his faults, but he didn't deserve to be shot. I could deal with that. I could right, deal with me that. Too. You know, but, but let's... But, but but let's be honest. Let's have a legitimate debate and say, okay, should the police be allowed to shoot somebody who's unarmed? Period. No matter what. But but let's not let's take take the person who is guilty of things and turn them into a sweet innocent kid who did nothing wrong. That's not the case. Right. He assaulted right. a And that's my just that's before. And that's my I'm main not, my, my main kind of like uh, uh problem uh, with problem all of this because that's what that's, that's what's what, happened. That's what happened. And people have really kind of like tried to liken this to the Trayvon Martin uh, incident. And, and, and the two are totally not the same. The only similarity is that they were both young black kids that, that were, were shot and, and, and died as a result of that. That's the only connection with those cases. I mean, and I don't understand the African-American community or the vocal. I should say... Because a lot of African Americans have actually spoken up against this. I reposted some of their videos and said how absurd it is and how they're ashamed to even be called that because of what's gone on. But the vocal African American community, the ones you see on the TV, I don't understand how they can't make that distinction. I mean, Trevon Martin wasn't doing anything wrong five minutes before. He was walking through the neighborhood, you know? Not to rehash that case, but that's the reality. He was a kid walking through his neighborhood who got shot tragically. This this guy is possibly involved in a robbery just before, is on videotape assaulting a storekeeper, bullying him, and they're making it out like he was doing nothing wrong, and this cop just out of the blue shot him. Right. Right. But I mean, I've, seen, I've actually seen people, seen people in all of this calling uh, calling, uh, other people uh, racist, other people because, racist of because of their perspective on this. Tony, I'm just being, Tony, I'm I'm just being told by Blog Talk, can you... Can you put down your phone for a second and call back so we can just check, uh, we can just see if it's your line or mine? I, I sure can. You trying to get rid of me already, Xander? <laughs> no, no, not at all. We just want to get rid of this darn echo. Um, sure. So if you could, if you could put the phone down and call back, that that would be great. Um, so if you're if you're out there and you have an opinion on this, then call us three four seven eight eight four nine zero six one. That's three four seven eight eight four nine zero six one. Tell us what you think. We're having some different. We're having some uh, great feedback in the chat um, about about what the, what people actually think. Um, one of the things I just said in chat was that I was concerned that Officer Darren Wilson showed no remorse, even um, even why uh, even if um, he was in the right, he he should have uh, he should have kind of like said he was sorry. Uh, that's interesting that the echo was gone. Let's just see if when I bring Tony back on, it it comes. Hello, Tony. Welcome back. Thank you. The echo Any has better, gone, Xander? I think. The echo is gone, yes, okay. It has. So we were just saying, Tony, um, uh, also pe people want us to explain about who you are because they, they missed the intro. But just before we go to that, um, uh, my brain just died. Uh, we were talking in, uh, we were saying in the chat room about the concern about the fact that Officer Darren Wilson didn't show any remorse. Oh, Xander? Gosh, it's back. Go on. Uh, if I may make a comment on that, there's no re. If his story is to be believed, okay, that's if he's telling the truth. Right. That that's insane. Why would you show? 
why would you show remorse? If somebody attacked you and you were defending yourself and you knew in your heart you did the right thing, you know, if somebody broke in my home and I was afraid that they were going to kill me and the police interviewed me, I wouldn't show remorse. I, I, I would feel confident in what I did to defend myself. So I don't think that's, that's valid. And also a police officer, most police officers, I should say, have some sort of morality and and they have an obligation to protect and serve. So you know what? In that officer's view, look, I stopped the bad guy, you know, and I was defending my life. Why would he show why would he show remorse? In his view, the the, the kid was a thug who just committed a crime, who rushed him, who was going to kill him. So why would why would he I, show remorse? <laughs> right, I totally see that, but I would still I, I see that the same, but I would still be sorry that the kid had died. Because because he didn't deserve to die for for what he did, um, but the fact he died as a byproduct of of what he did is 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 sad, and and I don't mean he sh- he shouldn't be sorry for the fact that he upheld the law, but I still think that we expect a little bit of empathy from our police officers. I I don't know. I kind of dis- I honestly disagree with you there. Let me give you an analogy. They have blocked the malls on Black Friday and the roadways, and they've protested, right? Okay, so let's say I'm in my vehicle trying to get to work, and they're blocking the road. And I'm beeping my horn, and I'm beeping my horn, and I'm screaming, and I'm cursing that I'm going to lose my job if somebody don't get out of the road, right? So I start to pull forward in my vehicle, right? And just as I'm pulling forward in my vehicle... Before I have the time to – most of them are, say, getting out of the way because they see me slowly moving forward, and it's a game of chicken. But let's say one young protester decides at the last minute to throw himself in front of my vehicle even though I'm moving forward. The police question me. I'm not going to feel a bit of remorse. You know what I'm going to turn around and say? He deserved it because he jumped in front of my vehicle, and I had to right. get to work or lose my job. And I wouldn't show remorse. And that's my personality, though. If I'm on the moral high ground and I didn't do anything wrong, I am not going to show the least bit of remorse. Where there's doubt, no. I'll second look at it. Where I'm wrong, I'll be the first to admit it. But if I have done nothing wrong, I'm not going to show remorse because it makes somebody no. else feel better. I'm going to turn around, and look them in the eye, and say, I was right. The other person was wrong. End of story. If the truth offends you, so be it. Exactly. Nope. But you see this doesn't mean this doesn't mean that anyone that agrees with Darren Wilson happens to be racist or or it doesn't mean that anyone doesn't agree uh with uh with the with the other side of the perspective that that, that they um you know they have issues too. But what concerns me long term with this, they reckon that over the past ten years the number of people um, becoming police officers has declined. And and I think that long term, um, things like this are going to have an effect on on the way that police officers do their job. Because if someone has committed a crime, a police officer should not have to look at the color of their skin before they respond. Because the level of response should be the same whether they're a black person or a white person if if a crime is being committed. And no way on this earth should police have to treat anybody any differently because of the color of their skin, whether they be black or white. And I am genuinely sad that this kid kid got killed, but but I don't want to say he brought it on himself because I'm going to get a ton load of emails saying that I'm racist, but he put himself in a position, and his, act- his actions didn't help him, well, is what I'm trying to say, and, you know? And a- actually, Xander, I'll say what you're unwilling to say with a caveat, with with a big disclaimer. If Darren Wilson's story is correct and factual, and that's a big if because I wasn't there, okay? Right. If Darren Wilson is telling, if Officer Wilson is fully accounting the facts, not leaving anything out, and telling the whole truth, and this kid ch- just committed a strong arm robbery and then charged at him and was in his vehicle struggling for his gun to attack that officer and possibly kill him, then Michael Brown deserved to die. And I will say that because it's the truth. And I'm not going to apologize for the truth, whether that's me or you, white, 
black, right. any color, any religion of skin, if if we com- go out and commit a robbery and then charge at a police officer and attempt to take their gun to take their life, we deserve to be shot and killed. And that's the hard, cold facts. Now, that's if the story is accurate, okay? So if Officer Wilson is to be believed, then, yes, Darren Wilson, I'm sorry, Michael Brown deserved to die because anybody that charges at a police officer and attempts to take their gun from them is intent on killing that police officer. Right. And deserves what they get. So no political correctness for me there. Now, that's a big, that's a big if. That's if the story is factual and true. You can't say, oh, nobody deserves that. No, he deserved that. You know, if I go out and commit a robbery, if I go to a store and hold them up with a gun and the store owner shoots me and I'm pointing a gun in their face, you can't say, oh, I didn't deserve it. No, I deserve it. Interesting point just been brought up in the chat room, Tony. If if that was your kid that that happened to, what what would your response be? Be. If that was your 18-year-old son that that had been killed in in that situation, I mean, I'm more than prepared to admit that I think that that his his actions were wrong, but I don't. Um, but 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 uh, you know, I wonder if if would react differently if, if that was your son. If that was my son, I would be taking, I would be attacking the right issues. I'd be very sad for my son, but first of all, I would be admitting my son was no angel. I wouldn't be lying and being a hypocrite on national TV, telling the public that Officer Wilson murdered my poor and his son in cold blood, and then seeing a videotape of my son committing a strong arm robbery and telling the public not to judge him that he was a good boy. That's hypocritical and that's insane. Right. I'd be taking responsibility for my son's actions, saying, hey, he messed up. But this is a tragedy. Can't we do something about the issue here that right. instead of getting shot, maybe every cop should have a taser or, or, or maybe there's a way to prevent this. And I'd be looking at the broader issue. I don't want this to happen to somebody else's kid. And I'd be saying, hey, if my son got help earlier, if my son got help, this wouldn't have happened. That's what right. I'd be saying. Two, two interesting points from the chat room. Um, Brenda wants to know. If you if you thought that the number of shots were necessary, uh, and Joe wants uh, Joe, Joe wants me to point out to you that eighteen year olds do not have a fully developed brain; they are still growing the part that helps them with impulse control. But I'm sure that that, that, that Joe is not not saying that um, that excuses um, Michael Brown's behavior. So the first question was about. Um, the number of shots. Do you think that the number of shots was actually necessary? Well, um, the truthful answer to that is I don't know because I wasn't there. I know that if I was in the situation, face, if I owned a gun, which I don't, but I, if I had a gun and somebody was charging at me trying to take the gun, I'd fire as many shots as I deemed necessary. So I think that's a, that's a side issue, and that could be we're talking of impulsive, I mean, adrenaline running or whatever, you know. Somebody could be dead and you could shoot them five more times, you know, just on the adrenaline, I think. I mean, I'm not speaking from medical knowledge there, obviously, but I I don't think we can judge that based on the number of shots necessarily in the heat of the moment. I mean, one thing that that doesn't get out a lot about the story is this wasn't something that occurred over a couple of minutes or a half hour or a long period of time. This was a decision that occurred within a matter of seconds in the heat of the right. moment. So that officer did not have to think, oh, is, is this young man being too impulsive? What else could I do? Or, or oh, how many shots are necessary? Or maybe I should r- move my car to the other end or whatever. Police aren't trained to react that way. And if we want them trained to react that way, then there's going to be a lot more crime probably happening in this country. I, I know if I report a, you know, if I report a burglary or whatever and the police show up at my at my house, I don't want them sitting around seeing some young people outside saying, well, maybe they're not really intent on burglarizing or maybe we could just talk to them about it. I want the police showing up with their guns blaring, being prepared to shoot, to defend me. Um, and as far as impulsiveness goes, and young people, yes, that is true. Young people do not have a fully developed brain that does not excuse their actions or the consequences of what they do. That does not, I mean, I I would feel the same way 
let's let's change the narrative a little bit for a thing. Right. Let's say that that was a white boy who was mentally retarded. Okay. Let's say that he severe mental problem, and that was a white boy, and he wasn't really capable of of grasping the full significance of what he was doing, and he was aggressive and violent because of his his lack of development, okay? That would be somebody right. with a legitimate disability. I would feel the same way. I would still feel the same way. How do you expect that officer to respond? His life is threatened, and no, that officer is not responsible to, fight, to to sit there then, let's say it was somebody with, um, with mental retardation, to say, oh, well, he, he might not know what he's doing or he might not know this and I should take this into account. The officer's trained to defend himself. Right. Just a couple of things from the chat, Tony. Um, Joe, Joe was asking uh, why you called it strong-armed robbery, but I don't think you did say it was strong-armed robbery, did well, you? Well, actually, that's what I read it. That's what I read from the headline to answer the question. Now, it may not, but I didn't know he, being what was he armed with. No, Hello, the term that I read it. again. I said that I believe that's the term that they use for Xander in the news account. Right, right. right. Um, and I'm just repeating see, what the news account said, and I don't know the specific. I don't think strong arm robbery has to mean using a weapon. I think that means like use of right. force. Uh, you know, uh, the other thing Joe is saying is that she's not saying the kid didn't deserve a consequence, just not death. And and I agree and I agree with that, but I do still strongly feel that his actions contributed towards that. Because if a police officer with a gun said to me, uh, put your hands up and and I knew I'd done nothing wrong, I would still have to abide by that until um until until I could you know, sit down and tell them my side of the story and whilst that seems unfortunate but punching an officer and all of these things did not help the the situation well and, and actually it really goes back to what i said earlier to answer joe's comment in the chat room if he was attempting to take that officer's gun and kill that officer that's where i'm saying he deserved what he got Okay. Now, if this was a young man just arguing or acting abrasive or intimidating, no, of course he doesn't deserve to be shot. I'm basing what I said on the account of Officer Wilson that this young man attempted to take his gun. And if you're attempting to take a police officer's gun, you're attempting to do them harm, i.e. kill them. Right. So now, if that's to be believed, and that's a big if, then he deserves what he got. Now, if he was just they're arguing or rushing the cop, of course not. Then that's not justified. I'm basing that solely on Officer Wilson stating that the youth was struggling to get his gun to kill him. Big difference. Right. So so I, I, I kind of, you know, that, that there are so many um, opinions on this, and, and I think that it's sad that, that, that both sides are kind of never going to agree, but I do... I do think that it's an importance not to generalize um, about um, police officers because they're the first ones that we uh, we go to uh, when we need when we need assistance and and to term them all as um, you know as, as as racist and bad cops is is really kind of a concern. Would you not agree? I would agree, and I think that the real civil rights issues here in this country are being ignored because of this, and it's really a shame what, what, they, agree. what the civil rights groups do to themselves. There is a disproportionate, a highly disproportionate amount of African-American people locked up. It's like 10 to 1. I mean, I'm not quoting an actual statistic, but it's that dramatic. That's the issue that needs to be addressed, and if it's them committing more crime than the issue of, well, why are they committing more crime? Is it the poverty? Is it the homelessness? Is it the discrimination? That's the legitimate civil rights issue here. They don't want to speak right. that about their youth that kill, kill each other 
on a regular basis, you know? They, they just want to speak about one cop and one kid. It should never have amounted to this. The real issues are being ignored right here, which is there is a problem with the system that I will give them. And I think everybody agrees with that. There's a problem with the system. However, body cameras are not are not the answer. I don't believe in the body cameras because a camera only tells can see. And I don't believe we should take this incident and require all police officers to wear body cameras, not because body cameras wouldn't be help, helpful, but because I think we would trust what the camera says too much. And cameras can think- lie. People can fool them at angles. So I think we still need to rely on eyewitness accounts, not just a body camera and what a camera says. And I think this is a big, uh, this is another big slap in the face for the police officers that actually do do a good job and um, and, and are being kind of like all, all kind of tarred with the same brush, all kind of put into the same uh, category because this is the um, assessment um, the 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 was made, and I don't think that, like I said, I don't think anybody's ever going to agree um, on on all of these points. But what I do hate is the fact that when you disagree, then then you're a racist. You know, I, I, I'm I'm the furthest I'm the furthest thing I'm the furthest person from a racist that you could ever find. But because I've disagreed with some of this, I've been termed as a racist and it kind of makes me sad because because it, it kind of like it, it illegitimizes when people really are racist you know it, it does and you know something it's kind of the boy who cried wolf there are racist police officers out there just like there's racist right. everyone that you know i mean there are racists everywhere what happens then when there is a legitimate case of a white officer say if that did happen shooting a black kid for no justifiable reason people like you or me or the general public are going to brush it off and be inclined to believe whatever the cop says because of all these stories you just have to look at it impartially and i understand that there's a lot of frustration because of what i talked about the disproportionate number of arrests harassment by the police that's where a lot of this is coming from. It's not just right. the one incident of the shooting. It's a it's a pent up frustration with the system itself and how it treats African Americans. I can understand that. What I do not understand under any circumstances, I said it last time under the Trevor, Trevon Martin case, I believe, the the looting, the rioting, the arson, the fire bombing. The shooting, but that, but that's all that, just an excuse to do those things, you know. What about all of those? What about all of those people in Ferguson that have lost their businesses? And most of them were African American. So, so you know, you you can't say, you know, you can't bring it back to the color. You know, most of those people who've lost their business were African American, and and it's and it's a great concern. I mean, I don't know. Can you get riot insurance? Uh, is you know is that something you can be insured for? Well, I actually have a little bit of a theory about that, and that's all it is is a theory. But notice how those riots were out of control and they burnt the businesses and looting this time around, right? Now the first time right. the police responded and they were all over the news for heavy-handed tactics. I have a personal theory that the order was given from the top down that they weren't going to respond to send a message to the people in America in general to say, see what happens when we don't do this. Let's see how you like it if we're not around. And that's just a theory. But I think unofficially that's what happened and the reason the police didn't step in and use the force to protect those businesses was because they were accused of using too much force and it it was kind of like a hands-off, okay, you don't want us to act fine, we'll show you what happens. Now, that's just theory, and you know, you know what happened as as happens in a lot of these situations. They they were um, protesters came in by bus by the bus load that were there just to cause trouble, and that is a concern. See, and I do want to correct one one thing, and we have the tendency to do this with terrorism as well. We try to be so apologetic that we try to differentiate between groups of people. Okay, we. We are saying 
oh, well, let's make a distinction. This is what you hear the news media saying all the time between the peaceful protesters and the rioters, right? I'm sorry, right. but there's not much of a difference between a, quote, peaceful protester that's blocking an intersection when I need to get to work and I have lawful use of the street and I have nothing to do with what's going on than somebody burning down a store. The tactics are more extreme, but they're equally wrong. They're equally wrong to protest something where a lawful jury said there's not enough evidence here. They're equally wrong. See, we say, oh, well, the good protesters, the good protesters. Guess what? There are no good protesters in this case, in my view. Okay, because the system ran its course. You're not you, you're not arguing against an oppression. If he wasn't brought to trial, if he wasn't if it wasn't brought before a grand jury, yes. But it was brought, and the system said not enough evidence. Now, if you want your own Wait. children to be convicted based on public opinion at the time and what people think happened on the news media, then let's go that route by all means. But the country would be a much different place. So these peaceful it, protesters... It would. It would. I mean, no justice, no peace basically implies a riot. Let, let's be real here. The very slogan, no justice, no peace. Okay, no peace? W what are you implying? We had his stepfather who needs to be charged, and the authorities are not doing their lawful duty with not charging his stepfather with inciting a riot who was on TV screaming, burn the city down, burn it right after the yes, verdict. Yes, he was. Yeah, he saw that. And, and, and we have apologetic, apologetic people saying, oh, he was caught up in the heat of the moment. Okay, so, so basically Officer Wilson, even though there's not enough evidence, should be charged with murder. But somebody that told everybody to burn, burn the city down, and then they start burning the city down, shouldn't be charged because he should get the benefit of the doubt? It's hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy at its worst form. Well, you know, I think this, I think this conversation uh, will, will go on um, for some time uh, in, in the media, so we can kind of like, we, we, we can follow that. I just, I just hope that people stop with, with all the, the name calling just because someone doesn't agree with you, doesn't make them racist. And, and I think that if we want to make the world a better place, we have to actually base um, the moving forward on, on the things that we agree on, not the things that we don't, because those things are never going to change. Um, so let's look at our uh, last story, uh, which I found kind of exciting, actually. Um, the Osbournes are back. It's official. VH1 has revived the original reality series starring Ozzy, Sharon, Jack, and Kelly Osbourne. The Viacom-owned network is near a deal for a new batch of episodes of the former MTV reality series. The series, the new story, comes after Sharon Osbourne has been public about the show's revival, noting that it was likely going to come back for six or eight episodes. The news comes nearly 10 years after the Os Osbourne signed off a VH1 and the show, which earned a 2002 Emmy for Outstanding Reality Program, launched in March 2002, and its freshman one run was cited as the most viewed series ever on MTV at the time. Now, the unscripted series, which at the time followed Rocker Ozzy and his wife manager and their children, helped to launch the careers of Sharon, Jack, and Kelly, who are now all firmly ensconced in the entertainment industry. So, uh, uh, is this good news for you? Did you like the Osbournes? Is it something you might like to see again, Tony? I actually, I, you know, I watched it once or twice when it was on. It was an okay show, and honestly, I'm not really into reality programs. I really don't watch many of them. When I watch TV, I tend to watch two things. The news to find out what's happening or people's opinions, and drama or comedy shows, because to me, there's enough reality when I watch the news and I go on shows like yours. I deal with reality all the time in my job, on your show, everywhere. Well, when I'm watching TV, I want to break from, <laughs> from quote, reality and the reality programming. Right. So I, I kind of miss the day when you could turn on Ozzy and Harriet, not that I was that old ever, but I mean, the, the shows like that, where it would just be a, be a break from reality. And I kind of miss that aspect, honestly. I mean, I, everybody watches reality TV to some extent, you know, whether it's true TV or cops or, 
you know, what, what at cheaters or whatever, and we all get hooked. But honestly, I, I, I really like to escape when I watch TV and watch a good movie or a good fantasy. Right. I don't think I don't think the reality TV that came after it was really what you could uh, determine as uh, reality TV because mostly the stuff that came after it was just scripted. And apparently the Osbournes wasn't scripted. They just kind of like they just they just followed them. And and I think that after that they kind of broke the mold. Every, all of the other reality based TV after that was was just too heavily scripted to to be to be termed as real what they would call real uh reality tv and, and i think that's, that's the case as well i mean i think the first reality hello people, your phone yes. is messing up again tony can you hear me now xander uh xander? you're very faint hello i'm re- i'm very faint okay Oh, uh, you're back now. You're back now. I'm back now. Uh, I, I think you that are. every reality show it, it, that, I mean, I watched Cops when it first came out as a kid, and I loved it, you know? But I always wondered even then how much of that was scripted with a camera present or were the officers reacting differently because there was a camera. You know, and there's that aspect. I think anybody that watches reality TV with a brain has to realize that it's not really reality, you know? Right, Exactly. I, I think there's a nostalgic uh, side to this with bringing back um, the Osbournes because um, I think I think they've kind of they've grown up before our eyes because when we first started watching the Osbournes, the kids were like really young, and and now they're both kind of like working in TV and and Sharon Osbourne is everywhere, and I think it will be it will be good to see them like ten years on. Um, and and kind of like see see the changes, uh, uh, et cetera. I mean, I I always said I would never do a reality show, but if they came and offered me a reality show now, I would bite their hands off because all these people that do reality shows they get seem to get so much uh, from it afterwards. You know, the the knock on effect of mm-hmm. of how much publicity actually gives you. Um, and, and how many uh, opportunities uh, come come from it? Would you would you uh, can you imagine you and Ter- you and Kiko being involved in a reality show? Well, actually, it's interesting you ask that because there's a little bit of debate with these reality shows that have the families involved if the parents aren't exploiting the children, you know, and if the children right. have any say in the matter, or if the parents aren't making money off the children. And I think that that's an issue. Is more and more of these reality shows where children come up that needs to be um, talked about. I don't know whether I do a reality show for money. I could tell you what reality show I would want to see on a TV that they haven't made yet, which I think would be fascinating. Can you hear me, Xander? I can. What would that be? Um, I would like to see a reality show based on the first family, whether it was President Obama's family or another president. Not, Not obviously on the secret stuff the president does, but it would be really cool to put cameras inside the White House and see. You mean like how you mean the like the naked family. golf games that that the president plays and things like that, and <laughs> and, and 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 watching <laughs> Michelle go Michelle off to burger off bars and bar stuffing bar her face and stuff. Whatever it is, whatever it would be, you know, just to see how a normal family lives in the White House with all that, you know, just the the, the little details of it. I think that would be fascinating. To, to see, like, the first family in a reality show. Obviously not the secret stuff the president does, but just their interactions with the staff and the bullying each other on a daily basis, how it affects them. I think that would be be a great show. <laughs> do you think they would ever... Do you think that they would ever allow that with, with things like the Secret Service and stuff like that? Well, I don't know, actually, and that, probably not. I mean... But I don't think that – I think you could do it without risking any security measures. Like, you, obviously, reality shows, no matter what, are edited and cut, you know? I mean, you just take the samplings. Like, you know, how, how does, for instance, the the child react to the Secret Service member around him when he wants to be alone or, you know, or when the food isn't to their liking or things like that or a visitor or what happens when a vase gets broken in the White House? Just <laughs> – Little things that the families face on a daily basis, like how how, it, how does the first family react to that? I think it would be fascinating. <laughs> right. Didn't uh, did you see that recently where um, 
someone in the GOP had said that they weren't weren't being very classy. No, I didn't. And it's a shame that comments like that are are made. And you know, I I get on both sides for the ignorant comments, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican. I mean, both whether you're on the left or the right, you tend to pick apart the other side and say, well, they're ignorant, they're this, they're that, they're hateful. The truth is, both sides say some really hateful, ignorant, uncalled for things. I mean. Exactly. The, the right exactly. wing tends to have them publicized more because it's all over the news the next day, but the left says some things too. It's both ways. Absolutely. Well, listen, Tony, we're, we're coming to the end of our time together uh, today. Tell people uh, where they can um, find you uh, on social media. Well, you can just look me up on Facebook at Anthony Lasaco. Um, if you have trouble spelling that, that's L-O-S-A-C-C-O. Uh, you can follow my political post in detail. I'm not, as you know, Xander, much of a Twitter fan because I like to speak a lot and talk, and Twitter doesn't exactly allow you to do that. But you can find me at the full story, I believe it's 2014, on Twitter. And occasionally I will post to that. Uh, the best place to find me is definitely on Facebook. Might I say one thing before we get off the air? You may indeed. I think going back to the whole Ferguson thing and the debate it's caused, no matter what side you are on of that issue, it's important to take the race out of it. And I know it sounds cliche but the I thing agree. is, don't picture that child as black or white. Picture it as a, a human being. He was a human being. So take the color out of it. Did he deserve it? Did he not? Were the officer's actions reasonable? And that that's the way we need to view things like this and not inject color, race, creed, nationality into it, but just look at the individual circumstance and look at it as this was a human being, what should have been done on both people's part. On the officer's part, he's a human being, and on the part of Michael Brown, who's a human being, both of which exactly. deserve the rights of every American citizen. Absolutely. And on that note, thank you so much for joining us today, Tony. I hope you come back and join us again uh, in the next few weeks. And uh, you have a great weekend. Say hi to, Co to Kiko for us. You too, Xander. Thanks for having me on. Brilliant. Thanks a lot. That was uh, Tony Lasaco. Make sure you check him out on uh, Facebook and uh, Twitter. His info is all on the show page for today. Thanks to everybody um, in chat. Uh, thanks for joining us. It's uh, always good to uh, chat with you. Um, thanks to everybody uh, for listening today. Uh, thanks to everyone who's made this show possible. Thanks to Tony for co-hosting, and thanks to you for listening and your continued support. Don't forget to check out Episode 7 of my TV talk show, Xandermonium, Friday, December 5th on Channel 68 on Optimum and 34 on Verizon. And if you're not in the area, you'll be able to check it out right after on YouTube. Oh, yes, indeedy. So thanks for listening. We'll be back with you next week with uh, Typo Ligar, and my guest in part two is the uh, fabulous comedian Georgie Porgy. Thanks so much, and I love you all. Bye-bye.